Now Naaman was, the command, was commander of the army of the king of Aram. He was a great man in the sight of his master and highly regarded, because through him the Lord had given victory to Aram. He was a valiant soldier, but he had leprosy. Now bands from Aram had gone out and had taken captive a young girl from Israel, and she served Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, If only my master would see the prophet who is in Samaria, he would cure him of his leprosy. Naaman went to his master and told him what the girl from Israel had said. By all means go, the king of Aram replied. I will send a letter to the king of Israel. So Naaman left, taking with him ten talents of silver, six thousand shekels of gold, and ten sets of clothing. The letter that he took to the king of Israel read, With this letter I am sending my servant Naaman to you, so that you may cure him of his leprosy. As soon as the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his robes and said, Am I God? Can I kill and bring back to life? Why does this fellow send someone to me to be cured of his leprosy? See how he's trying to pick a quarrel with me? When Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his robes, he sent him this message. Why have you torn your robes? Have the man come to me, and he will know that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman went with his horses and chariots and stopped at the door of Elisha's house. Elijah sent a messenger to say to him, Go, wash yourself seven times in the Jordan, and your flesh will be restored and you will be cleansed. But Naaman went away angry and said, I thought that he would surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God, wave his hand over the spot and cure me of my leprosy. Are not Abana and Farpar, the rivers of Damascus, better than any of the waters of Israel? Couldn't I wash in them and be cleansed? So he turned and went off in a rage. Naaman's servants went to him and said, My father, if the prophet had told you to do some great thing, would you not have done it? How much more then when he tells you, wash and be cleansed? So he went down and dipped himself in the Jordan seven times, as the man of God had told him. And his flesh was restored and became clean like that of a young boy. This is the word of God for us this morning. Well, we are beginning a, a new series. It is a, a new year, and uh, I think time to get moving, and, and sometimes a new direction for each and every one of us. I kind of take time to think about that new direction God has in a new year, and uh, the focus we're going to take this year is um, on this idea of trust the process. Uh, how many of you have heard that, that phrase before? Have many of you heard trust the process? It's kind of popular right now, and, and actually it started through sports. At least that's where I've first heard about it. Um, I don't know if you know this about me, but I really like sports. And uh, Helen always comments, I can watch any sport, even if I don't like it. And she, that's true. If it's sports, I can watch it. Uh, and I enjoy doing that. Uh, I prefer watching things I enjoy. Like this last week, I watched a lot of Iowa basketball. And that was good to watch our men and women, both Beath and Maryland, uh, this past week. Um, but if college basketball is not on, I will watch the NBA some. Uh, I prefer NBA playoffs, but I'll even take games right now if nothing else is on. Uh, but it's through the NBA that that phrase, trust the process, I believe, got its kind of forming and, and became uh, popular today. It was years ago that the Philadelphia 76ers, so that's the professional team in Philadelphia, they were not very good. Um, they did not win a lot of ball games, but they also just didn't know where they were going. They didn't have great direction. They'd been through many different coaches uh, over several years and trying to find that. And so uh, years ago, five or six years ago, I think it was, they got a new general manager and a new coach. And the two of them started to use this phrase, trust the process, trust the process. And they would say that often in their press conferences, and they'd say that to their team. And, and the process that they were going through was that they had decided instead of being a not very good team, they were going to be a terrible team. That was their plan. We're going to be terrible, just the worst in the league for a few years, which means we're going to get the best draft picks. Uh, because the worse you are, the better draft picks that you get. And having those better draft picks, they will then draft uh, high-talent young people uh, to form their team. And after getting a few of those, then they really have a good core to develop a good team. And so that was their plan, is we're going to be the worst there is. And for two or three years, they lost more basketball games than anybody else in the NBA. But they would continue to say, trust the process. And that was a reminder to them that these, this losing was with purpose, Right? There was meaning in this loss. We're going to give up some short-term wins for a long-term victory. 
That was the point of trusting the process. Give up those short-term wins because in the long term, uh, we're going to win that victory and become a better team uh, all around because of this losing. And after several years of doing that, uh, they did turn things around. Last two years, they've been pretty good. Last year, uh, the 76ers were one of the teams that people thought might be able to get to the championship game in the NBA. They didn't, uh, but they, they were still in the playoffs and, and doing okay, which was a lot better than they had been the years before that. This year, I would say, again, they're in the mix uh, of, of things. And so um, trusting the process helped them through that time of losing to get to where they, they wanted to be, to have the, the winning seasons now uh, that they have. And so when we think about trusting the process, it's just knowing where you're going. Um, that's what it's all about. And that's what I want us to be thinking about in this new year is trusting the process that we have and knowing where it is that God is calling us. And so in the beginning of the year, we like to kind of just remind ourselves of where God is calling us to go. And so we do have a mission and we have a process that we use here at Christ Church. Our mission is to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. That's what we really want to do. That's our, our big victory, is to make more disciples for Jesus Christ, and that will transform the world. And as I thought about that mission and our denomination and kind of the conflict and, and the divide that's going on within our denomination, I was reminded that our mission is not to make more Methodists, right? That's not our mission. That has not been our focus. That's not ever been my focus, to make more Methodists. It's to make more disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. And so even if there is this divide uh, or split coming, um, we're not going to lose focus on Jesus and, and making disciples of him. Uh, it won't be fun or enjoyable to go through that, uh, but I know that our focus will remain the same as Christ Church, that we'll be continuing to make disciples uh, for Jesus Christ so that we can transform the world. Uh, but the other piece of us being United Methodists, too, is that Methodists have a method, uh, a way to do things. And, and that's what our discipleship process is. That's our method uh, to, to grow in our discipleship. And so our method, our process, is what we talk about every week, experiencing God's love and worship, developing relationships in small groups, and reviving the world through service. And so, again, I want us to be thinking about how am I trusting that process and how am I moving through that process. I want each and every one of you to take time um, this week and, and this month uh, for the next three weeks to be thinking about, all right, what's my next step? What's the new step that God might have for me as I uh, move through this process, uh, this discipleship process to grow closer to Jesus Christ? Uh, if you are, are worshiping and you have a small group, then your next step is to serve to find a place to serve inside the church or outside the church. Find a place to do God's work. Uh, if you're coming to worship and you have a place of service but you don't have a small group, your next step would be find that small group. Uh, find that place that you can connect with other people regularly to, to grow in your connection to Christ. Uh, if you don't do any of them, uh, then probably... You're here, so uh, connecting in worship uh, is a good place to start. Maybe that's your step, is just to engage worship uh, more regularly or, or more often, and, and that could be the next step. I don't know what it is for each and every one of you. It's different for all of us, but I believe that each of us have a place in that process, and if we trust it and if we work the process, uh, God will lead us to where he wants us to go and help us to make disciples and help us to transform the world. And so start thinking today about what is that new step, what's that next step that God wants me to do in the process. And, and as I thought about trusting the process, I was uh, quickly, I thought about this scripture passage uh, from 2 Kings. Uh, I was remembering the man uh, Naaman. And, and the passage starts out talking very highly of Naaman. It said he was a great man, uh, he was a great commander, he was a great warrior uh, in the army. And the king of Aram really looked up to Naaman. Uh, he was a good guy, and yet it said he had leprosy. Uh, which is just, he had a skin disease. Um, it, we don't so know exactly what it would have been, but it was something that they thought probably was contagious, probably would have pushed him away from community and from connecting with other people. And so it was a, a large difficulty in his life, even though it's not talked about too much on the difficulties, but he had leprosy, and so that was something that troubled him. And then it said that they had taken captive of some people from Israel, and one was a young girl that then became the, the slave, the servant of Naaman's wife. And when she saw that Naaman had leprosy, this servant girl said to, to her master, said, hey, you should send your husband to the prophet in Israel, the prophet in Samaria, and he'll be able to cure him of his leprosy. And, and as I saw that, uh, that suggestion, that, that offer of a cure uh, to Naaman, at first I was interested in that because my first thought is, why would someone who's a slave tell their master how to get healed? Wouldn't a lot of us want to keep that information to ourselves? 
If someone has captured us, enslaved us, we become their servant. And, and wouldn't we want to kind of keep some good information from our, our master? Uh, but it did say it was a young girl. And so I thought, that's probably a response of a young girl. A young, innocent girl wants to care for even her captor. And she wants to offer what she can to help him uh, and for him to find healing in his life. And, and so she offers that, that uh, healing to him. But the other interesting part of this, as I, I looked at it a little bit too, is that there is no evidence in the scripture of Elisha, that's the prophet in Israel or Samaria, uh, there's no evidence in the scripture of him healing anyone of leprosy. And yet she says, hey, he can heal you of leprosy. So my thought is either she's heard of that or she assumes he's going to do it, but we don't have that in the scriptures. And so I wonder where she got that idea from. And maybe she did hear of him doing that. All we have is that he did some other miracles. Uh, oh, actually, at one point, uh, there was an axe head that sunk in uh, some water, and he made it float to the top so that they could uh, retrieve it. Uh, there were several times that they kind of had, like, poisonous water, and he helped to heal that. Uh, there was a time he took a cup, and he, he uh, caused it to endlessly flow oil out of that cup until other uh, things were filled up, and they had enough of the oil. Uh, there was even a time a boy died, and, and Elijah called him back to life. And so we have evidence, all these other miracles, but not one of healing leprosy. And so either she has heard of some healings of leprosy, or my other thought is this young girl thought, well, he can do miracles. If he can do those things, he can heal leprosy. And so I'll just say, hey, you need to go there. That's where the cure is. That prophet in Israel, he'll be able to help you. That's the cure. And I was thinking, too, with the Philadelphia 76ers and they're trusting the process, when that cured that basketball program, uh, other people started to grab onto it. Uh, other sports, even, and other places just in regular life, business and things, you'll hear that phrase, trust the process, trust the process. All because it worked for the 76ers, others want to grab a hold of it now and use it for themselves. Just trust the process and, and do the process, and it'll turn out good. And honestly, I think, yeah, we'll grab a hold of it too, won't we? Uh, let's get a hold of that. Trust the process. We have a discipleship process, a method uh, to, to grow in our faith, and we should be trusting that process. I believe that our discipleship process is the cure that we have to offer. Our discipleship process is the cure. It's what we can offer to people that, that are hurting and, and need healing in this world. We can offer them the cure, and we do that by offering them the discipleship process. If they're feeling like they're broken or they are not whole, they're not uh, made complete, that we offer them the process. And I believe through that process, God will bring healing into their life. And, and hear me clearly, I'm not, I'm not really thinking the process, if you just do these things, that it'll happen. I believe that this method is how we get closer to Jesus. And so really, it's Jesus that I trust. That's what I'm really saying is trust in Jesus. But if you tell someone trust in Jesus, they'll say, what's the natural question? How do I do that? Well, here's how you do that. You engage in worship. Here's how you do that. You get into a small group and you grow with other people there. Here's how you do that. You begin to serve and, and care for people. That's how you get closer to Jesus. I believe he works in the process. And that's why I would say, hey, just look to the process and begin to work that. Uh, so again, I, I really think I'm trusting in Jesus, and that's where the real cure is, the real healing comes from, but we engage him through the process. That's what we believe happens uh, through that. And what I really love about our process also is that you can offer it to, to anyone. That's why we say it every single week, because we want anyone and everyone to connect in the process. Uh, if you have, are just a brand new Christian, Look to the process. That will tell you what next step you need to take in your life. If you've been a Christian all your life, trust the process. Look at that. It will tell you what your next step is in life. If you feel like you're closer to God than you've ever been in your life, look to the process. It'll help you to stay there, to keep on moving in that direction. If you feel like you've fallen away from God, look to the process. It'll help to draw you back in. I think all of us can connect and engage because that's where Jesus meets us, is in those things that we offer uh, through our discipleship process. It, it connects with us. It can bring healing and wholeness to us, and that's why we offer it to anyone and everyone, uh, because I believe Jesus works through uh, the discipleship process that we have and that we use. And this young girl, this servant uh, from Israel, she sees the cure is in the prophet of Israel, and tells Naaman to, to go there, and he will be healed. And, and then we have this interesting piece of the passage where uh, the kings, the kings of Israel and the king of Aram, uh, 
misunderstand everything that's going on, but they try, you know. And he says, okay, I'll send you down there and I'll write you a letter. This will be helpful. And I'll write you a letter to the king. I'll send a big gift with you. And the way he knows kings work, kings are in charge of everything under their control, right? And so the king of Israel obviously is in charge of the prophet of Israel because the king controls everything. So I'll send him a big gift. I'll send him a letter saying, hey, could you do this for me? And because of the gift, because he's the king and he's in charge, then it will happen. Uh, that's what the king of Aram thinking. But does the king of Israel see it that way? No, he doesn't. He's like, why is he sending this person to me? And he's like, obviously he's trying to pick a fight with me because I can't heal people of leprosy. Uh, What's he thinking? And so he doesn't understand what is going on. Thankfully, Elisha hears about what's happening. He's like, hey, don't worry about it, king. I'll take care of it, okay? Uh, I'll let them know there is a prophet in Israel. So just send uh, Naaman down to me. And so Naaman and, and his whole crew go down to Elisha's house. It says they come to his door and Elisha doesn't even come to the door, right? He sends a messenger. He says, go tell him, just go wash himself seven times in the Jordan River, and, and he will be healed. And Naaman is excited about that, right? Did you hear the scripture? It said he was angry, and at the end he left in a rage. Uh, he was ticked. He was not happy. And, and I just love that, that humanness that is there, because we've all probably been there in different kind of situations. Uh, my first thought was, this is a man who feels like he has a life-threatening disease, and he's gone to the hospital to see the doctor. And guess what? Doctor doesn't even take the time to stop and be with him. He just sends the intern to take care of him, right? Most of us would be upset about that, wouldn't we? I want to see the doctor. I came to see the expert for him to tell me what to do. Naaman's expectations was the expert. The prophet would come out, uh, wave his hands over the spot. He said, say some magic words, call on his God, and then he would be cured. But that's not what happened. And so he went away angry because it didn't happen the way he wanted it to happen or he expected it to happen. And instead of just doing what was told, just following the process, he gets mad and frustrated about it. And I was thinking, how often do we do that? Can you think of times that you've done that where you see something, and and sometimes when something pretty simple is told to you, and you're like, well, that's just not going to work. I'm not going to do that, even when it's an expert that told you to do it. Uh, I remember years ago, I was in a group uh, boot camp where we would uh, work out, and I was getting in pretty good shape, uh, but I still had my belly. And so I'm like, how do I get rid of this? And I asked the trainer how to do that. I think I've told you all this before, but uh, he looked at me and said, James, Uh, abs are made in the kitchen, right? Not in the workout room. Abs are made in the kitchen. It's all about your diet, what you eat, and when you eat. And so he gave me this whole thing, told me what to eat, what foods not to eat, what time to eat, what time not to eat. Gave me all those things. I think I even wrote some of it down. And guess how much of it I did? None of it. Because I'm like, what if I just do more crunches, right? If I just do more sit-ups, uh, if I just work harder in my workouts, then obviously I'll get my six-pack of abs. And I just had in my mind, that's the way you do it. It's not about your, I'm not changing my food. Uh, I'll just change these things. I'll work harder and it will happen. And guess what? It didn't work. It didn't happen the way I wanted it to. It was, probably would have happened the way he said, but I don't know. Uh, <laughs> Naaman's doing the same thing. He's like, the expert has said, just go and do this simple thing go and wash in the Jordan, and he's like, I'm not doing that. That's not the way this is supposed to work. And then he even picks on the water in the Jordan. He's like, I can get cleaner water back home. These other rivers are clean. The Jordan was known as being kind of muddy and and unclean. He's like, I can get, if it's river water that I need, I got better stuff back at home. And and his servants call him out on it. And he's like, Naaman, if he had told you to do some complicated thing, wouldn't you have done that? If the prophet had come and said, all right, we need a camel's tooth, we need a flower from the top of the tallest mountain and water from this distant lake, you would have gone on a quest to heal yourself, wouldn't you? And and yeah, I, I would have done that. Then why not just go down to the Jordan and dip yourself seven times? And so Naaman's like, all right, I'll I'll give it a try. And he goes down, dips himself seven times into the Jordan River, and he's healed. He's made clean. And so what I was thinking for us today is that as we enter this new year and we begin to think about maybe where God might be leading us or, or calling us, or we think about just growing as Christians, that I think a lot of times in our minds we think, well, i got to do something big then, don't I? To really grow in my faith, i got to memorize the Bible, I have to go to Africa, I have to uh, give away everything. If I do those things, then I really will be growing as a Christian. And I want to tell you, you don't have to go on a great quest. All you got to do is, is trust the process. Look at the the three steps that we encourage you to take. Find yourself in there and say, God, what's the next one? What's the next small step that I should take in this new year? And do that. If you do that, 
I believe that God will work. You don't have to do a great quest. If you want a great quest, you can come and ask me for one, and I might give you one, but most likely I'll just say, all right, where are you in the process? And and what's the next step that you need to take? Let's just do that, and and I believe God will work. And so in this new year, try that something new. Find that new step that God has for you. I'm going to take a new step this morning. I I said in my Facebook video, if you saw that on Thursday, um, that I'm going to do something I've never done before while preaching. And so uh, we'll see if this works or not. I may not ever do it again. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to quote an Iowa State coach. Yeah, we'll see if this works or not. But, uh, you know, I've said a lot of people grab onto that trust your process. And one person that did is Iowa State football coach Matt Campbell. Uh, He grabbed onto that years ago. And it was two years ago that Iowa State had an amazing stretch in their season where they beat, I think it was like a top five Oklahoma team, and then they beat a top five TCU team the very next week. And uh, he gave a a speech to his team at the end of that game saying, guys, kind of uh, in a sense, the hard work has been paying off. A lot of people just want instant wins and they want to be great automatically. He says, but you guys have been working. And uh, we have the quote that he says in, in the midst of his talk there, if you fall in love with the process then eventually the process will love you back. If you fall in love with the process, eventually the process will love you back. And he's not really talking about loving a process, right? He's saying if you put in the practice, if you put in the hard work, if you do the things the coaches are are talking to you about, if you do those little simple things, then results will come. And they had just had a couple of really big victories. And he says, that's because we've been following the process. It works for us. If we love it, uh, it will come and it will work with us. And, and I believe the same thing about our discipleship process. If you fall in love with the discipleship process, it will love you back. If you fall in love with it and you begin to take those steps, results will follow. Results will follow. If you, if you do those things and, and you continue to trust the process and as you work in that process, uh, results will come. Now, you won't instantly be great and your life won't be perfect, just like Iowa State wasn't automatically a top five team after that, but they've gotten better, right? They have improved as they've been working on those things and trusting that process. And I believe the same thing for each and every one of us, that, that as we trust that process, as we work through it, that, that results will come, or res- results will follow after that. Uh, they will come. Uh, again, it's not going to be instant, but if we engage worship more, if we connect more and, and prepare our hearts for uh, worship and we engage there, I believe that Jesus will draw us closer to him and, and we will become uh, whole and, and be healed. I believe as we look at a small group, you know, if, if you look at a small group and you get into one and it's not the right one and you try another one and it's not the right one, trust the process. Keep on looking. It's hard to find the right one sometimes, but find that right one and results will come. Uh, sometimes it's hard to find a place to serve. Trust the process. Know that if you do find that right place, that that results will come. It's going to have to match with your gifts, with your graces, with your schedule, but but the right one is there. And just trust the process that if you can find that, uh, God will transform you and the world around you because of that. Uh, We have to fall in love with that process and and work it, and and results will follow. Uh, It will come if we are willing to do that. And and I don't just say that because I think it will happen. I, I say that because I've seen it. I've seen results of these things. I see people in worship that that God begins to speak something and I've seen God melt hearts and I've seen God transform people as uh, his spirit just kind of takes over in their life and and through that engagement and worship, they've experienced God's love and it begins to just kind of flow outside of them. I've seen people find the right small group and, and so many of them, they say, how did I make it through life without this group before now? And they said, how did I do it? And and how do other people do it without this support and encouragement from these people? uh, My life is so different, and I'm so glad that I found them. I I see that all the time. And and in serving the world, I see new life in people serving and giving of themselves, but I also see new life in the people that they serve, uh, those that they reach out to and and care for and touch. Uh, I've seen the results. And so that's why I say to you, trust the process. If you take those new steps that God is calling you to, it doesn't have to be some big quest, just that simple step that he puts in front of you. Just take that one this year, and and God will do work because it's through that process, that's our method uh, to get close to Jesus. And, And you will meet him there, and he will work in your life.